So thank you for letting me interview you. Ah, well, you know, I normally don't let strangers do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a customer of my <laughs> Well, I was hoping we could start off by uh, visiting a little bit of my past. Oh, it's and, about you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was hoping you could share uh, the the version of history that you remember uh, of uh, how Max and I uh, worked to fight big tobacco growing up. Uh, it's something I knew nothing about. You know, that, that was Wednesday, Wendy stuff and, and legislation and laws and everything. I feel yeah. that was like being on Mars to me. I would have never got involved. Yeah, you know, I'd be learning. I'd, I'd be teaching you how to start a business. <laughs> uh, and when I saw you two guys change a law, I mean that was the most amazing <laughs> thing. That I, I thought, holy shit! Yeah, you know, I thought you got to, had to go to Harvard to do that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like me being on the New York Times bestseller list. Yeah, you know, something that's just like Mars. You know, you know it, it, and me, and that would even be more. I mean, writing that was an accident. And, but 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 you guys, I, I saw the power of two kids, six and nine years old, to actually change a law. I mean, that that was incredible to me. And then what was more important though that I saw that what it taught you. You know, and, and your brother, that, that's why I remember somebody, the lobbyist was saying, you kids should be in school or something. And I would come to me, God, you're going to go to school and write a, a paper on how I spent my summer vacation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and here, you spent the last two days writing your testimony, you know, for that. I mean, that's what you go to school to do. <laughs> you know, and, and to have an application, so to have a real life application on how to write and how to communicate and, and, and give speeches in public and to actually do it all real and change the world or the county anyway. <laughs> you know, was just remarkable. What did we go to school for? The school just seemed almost irrelevant. <laughs> you know, to do that and uh, that, that's what's remarkable about it. And I see what Wendy does now with other young people doing that. I mean, that that is. And then I see how that carried in your work today. You know, I mean, so it gave you a career, an important career. The same with the young girls that she's working with on the same tacky dining room table, <laughs> sitting around uh, a camera on, on the, her uh, computer and talking to girls in Mali. And I remember the first time we were there at a, a, a uh, you know, a cyber cafe in Mali, and I'm looking at this camera, you know, through the game, and there's goats going on in the back, you know, they're not at <laughs> Starbucks down at Rockville <laughs> Pike, you know, this is real stuff, mm -hmm. and, and most of those girls now, after four years, are now planning, all got scholarships because of this work, and, and are going into international development because of this. I mean, besides knowing where Molly is, <laughs> which they learn, they have friends there, and they affected policy there, and they see that life is so big. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what's remarkable to them. And in our democracy, anyone can do it. And I guess maybe as you make me think about it, that's what, you know, I didn't know it was for me. It could be for me. Or, or whatever, when I saw, God, you kids could do it at six and nine years old. Why the hell do I do something? <laughs> I mean, that, that's what's remarkable to this. It was always, you know, I guess like everything, you know, gets complicated. I can never be do this because I don't have the heritage or pedigree or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and our democracy really isn't about that, mm -hmm. you know. And, and that was what's neat. And that's why, to me, I, all I saw in this country was, boy, anybody can start a business, you know? <laughs> And, and to be self-sufficient that mm -hmm. way, and, and that was always cool to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but to see anybody could really change the laws was mm -hmm. really cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what taught me. So that's what's so neat about having kids. You, know, you just mm -hmm. learn so much to the kids, and you guys keep teaching me. Like, what you're working on now, man, I would have never thought. And I would always think that would be, you know, you know just very strange. Mm -hmm. It was a, a fringy thing, and... and you know, sort of interesting intellectually, but, but, you know, so much of it seems right. You know, I mean, like, 
people who are, are locked in the circuit in the current system, you know, everything they do is not right. And mm -hmm. so the same thing people who are trying to change the current system, sure, everything they do not right is not right. So it, it's easy to pick out, you know, the wrong parts, you know, or what you think is obviously wrong and just mm -hmm. dwell on that mm -hmm. as opposed to um, uh, seeing you know, uh, the, the right parts. And, and particularly if the establishment, I mean, it's sort of like power corrupts and ultimate power corrupts ultimately. So that's what's so much more important about the fringe to work against that because mm -hmm. the people in power, you know, because they have all these supposedly right things and acceptability that you ignore what's wrong because they're acceptable. And, mm -hmm. and so that they have more... They're, and they're also they're more susceptible to abuse their power. So the more that we need, you know, someone uh, to to speak out uh, about that, you know, to fight the injustices or whatever. Thanks. Um, so you answered this a little bit um, before, but uh, I was going to ask what surprised you most about our journey, um, if anything. And it sounds like. You know, passing the law yeah. was probably the biggest surprise yeah. for all of us. Right. Um, was there anything after that? Um, some of the things well, you know, with I the lobbyist interactions came to mind a little bit. No, um, I, I actually, what came, as a dad, what I saw, it gave you both confidence. Mm. I mean, as a kid, I mean, I, I, had, I had no skills. You know, that I was not a good student. I was not in the band, couldn't play shit, you know. I was not a good athlete, so all those things, and I'm a short and fat, you know, I'm somewhat of a personality, so that, that carried me through a little bit, yeah. uh, So none of those things that you're looking for acceptance, and, you know, we all mm -hmm. want to be a value, you know, mm -hmm. and so in, in particularly in high school or grade school or whatever, you know, the person is the best athlete, gets all the adulation mm -hmm. and things like that, mm -hmm. and so what was cool to see that you guys, you know, had something, you Shit, you were at the White House. <laughs> yeah. no, not once, a few times. You were back up, you know, in Clinton and it was a Saturday speech, you know, and, and you gave testimony in the Congress. And then that, I mean, Jesus, you know, I mean, you were in the, the, the well, actually, did you introduced uh, bills for the Democratic Party on the smoking legislation? I don't remember that. Really? Oh, God, it was incredible. I mean, you had Donna Shalala there. Was it had, the press conference yeah, thing? Yeah, right. Oh, exactly. okay. Yeah, exactly. that press conference right. was cool. All right. right. So that, that was Henry cool. Waxman. I right, remember. exactly. Everybody. And yeah. you were the spokespeople for yeah. this. You know? So these two little kids being the spokespeople for every every member of Congress for, for this bill. I mean, gee. So this is. I mean, to me, I, I always felt in life the hardest hurdle to get over is me <laughs> and my own insecurities. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There, there's not a big, you know, conspiracy <laughs> to try to prevent me from succeeding. It's just me. <laughs> I have my own conspiracy mm -hmm. theory. Yeah. Your own worst enemy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's getting over that, and so positive feedback helps you get over those things. Mm -hmm. So I, I saw the confidence. So maybe you weren't the toughest or fastest or smartest kid in school. Maybe you you carried something around in your back pocket that was really cool. Yeah. yeah. And hearing about how both of you used it sometimes. Uh, now, I mean, I, I would erect a statue in my front yard <laughs> to this. Yeah. <laughs> and, and my sense is you guys used this plan C or D. You, know, you never brought it out yeah. until the ace in the hole. Right, I exactly. really need to impress right, someone, exactly, maybe. But. Right. <laughs> and, and that taught me a little humility. Huh. <laughs> I see. <laughs> well, neat. Thanks for delving down my history lane right. for a moment. Um, we'll shift gears a little bit to talk about your work, um, right. which, you know, I, I have always been very inspired by, even though I I you know haven't <laughs> traditionally considered myself taking over the business. Right. I, I do think it's a, a worthwhile cause and yeah. an important cause, yeah. um, and it's just not made it to my first you know passion. <laughs> um, but uh, I wanted to. It's just what you said that you just said something there. It, it just it hasn't risen to my first passion. Oh, it's not my primary passion. You oh, know, no. so, I mean, so I won't do it best. You know, well, no, I won't I be the best so, at it. But, but you know, it's so funny when I see you doing the whole bit. Man, that, that was my my uh, master's thesis. I did the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I managed information systems. Yeah. 
I got an AMA thesis, you know. All I did was create a bibliography. <laughs> and, and I couldn't, and, and because of computer, but, but you're more mathematical, you know, talented than I am. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know how far I got math, but calculus was the only one to me, too. Uh, and, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I see that. It never even occurred to me. I mean, people ask me that, you know, I, I yeah, I just see I want to do it till I die, and, and uh, if somebody wants to take it over, or the, or my staff finds somebody to mm-hmm. incorporate mm-hmm. it into somebody else's work, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. maybe. I mean, that's the only thing. Yeah. That I see. <laughs> and as we've talked about too, I mean, the one of the most promising futures for it maybe is if that online community yeah. reaches a critical mass where it right. self-sustains. That right. seems to be one of right. that that's uh, yeah. That's why I, I keep it open as as. I'm not married to a uh, a payable model, mm-hmm. you know, subscription, mm-hmm. maybe something yeah. else. Uh, but it, that's what, yeah. 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 And even now, even a subscription model, I'm, I'm trying to make it more of a community. I mean, I'm getting random phone calls now, like, hey, I need help. I used to be long, but I still need help. Mm-hmm. And that's good. Yeah. 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 So I wanted to go back in your history <laughs> and and ask you uh, how you first got interested in, in these types of government programs. Uh, like what led you to your first consulting business uh, with, with this kind of information? What, God, I mean, uh, I mean business was all my, always my thing. I, I really didn't care what kind of business I wanted. I, I wasn't sophisticated enough to know. I mean, I think of a, a, a men's store, you know, growing mm-hmm. up, I mean, that was mm-hmm. the, uh, my dad had a factory, and I know I didn't want that. I worked retail in college. And I know I didn't want that mm-hmm. because you had to be there all the time. It was like a restaurant or whatever. I wanted something more flexible, mm-hmm. some office kind of thing. I went into computers. I don't know why. I mean, I went to school, but uh, mid '60s. When I came back, computers were starting, and I took a class in computers, I think an undergraduate at the time, very basic, and I, again, I wasn't geek, a real geeky like you are, physics and stuff like that would never interest me, uh, but computers did for some reason, uh, so an MBA program, I had to choose something, and, and management information systems, which was computerized management information system, appealed to me, and I did that, and that was the beginning of the 70s, and then there was uh, they were starting to have computers, were starting and would be taught at colleges, so I taught at another college computers because I was taking a class, the same class, I've just got my students a week behind me. Uh, but it, <laughs> it, 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 it's like in your work now, being on that cutting edge, mm-hmm. if you have one week experience more than anybody else, you're the professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and. What I started a business earlier helping Vietnam vets, another couple of Vietnam vets and I in, in grad school. I and it was information oriented because we felt frustrated being in Vietnam. There wasn't, you know, Wi Fi and everything and the web and stuff like that and getting jobs. So we would put ads in the Stars and Stripes newspaper if they needed help getting information about stuff here. Mm-hmm. So it was like an information business. Uh, then getting the MBA. I, I ran computers for somebody else, and I was looking. But I, I know my my stuff in MBA was management information system, and it was uh, how to get information to top management to make decisions. What what information does a manager need, or you know, any high level management need to make their decisions? And that's what I studied more or less. Mm-hmm. So I was looking for that. But when I graduated, got a job running computers you know, for somebody. Back then it was punch cards. Let's uh, leave. But I always wait for a second. I go put them upstairs. Morgan took one of them off, I think. Okay. I can take them downstairs. I just put her in my room. Okay. 
Yeah, so they get your cookies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry. Where were yeah. we? Oh, I have management information. So that's it. And look at it. I said, well, God, you know what? I'd love to do is design how management could find out about their world around. And see, this was 1973-ish kind of thing, right after the oil embargo. Mm -hmm. And that was really the, the magic time in art history. Mm -hmm. It really was. And you look at all the data, and, and you look at the data I did about uh, what a 30-year-old makes. It all starts about 1933 or 1973, mm -hmm. where it goes down to the oil embargo. Yeah. That's what shocked. Every, that's what changed the world to me and everything everything happened mm. uh, that's when um, income started going down that's when everything world changed and so before then running a business in the United States you didn't have to worry about anything outside your company you know there was no you just had to worry about like payroll and manufacturing and employees and you know stuff like outside the company nothing so I, you know, to me, in particular, being a Vietnam and all this kind of stuff, God, we have to worry, you know, and, and this company, halfway around the world, nobody knew about it. You'd think nobody knew about Iraq, just like in 1973. <laughs> yeah, nobody yeah. knew about these companies, and that's when OPEC started and everything. See, so they band together and said, hey, we could screw the rest of the world, <laughs> you know, by controlling this stuff. And so I said, what top management, what affects their company more is not what's internal, but what's external. <laughs> so I was, I said, what every... I you know anybody running a business in this country really has to know about their external, not mm -hmm. their internal. So I just I want to design a monitoring system. I call it an external management information system, <laughs> where I monitor your competitors, I monitor your market, your legislation that affects cool. you, uh, the technology that affects you, mm -hmm. and all, all these other four or five external factors. And we mm -hmm. get a report every month, and nobody knew what the hell I was talking about. Huh. I mean. It, they just weren't ready, yeah. yeah. And and then I said, well, I do research. <laughs> oh, competitors, yeah, I wonder about that. And, and so Bill really did the same thing, just yeah. getting information about your competitors. Mm -hmm. And it was really investigative and through public documents. I was in Washington here, mm -hmm. so you want to know. I, and it was really through mergers and acquisitions I started. And actually, see, I was I was trying to not get. I was trying to think about five, ten years. Boy, I was very active in the Congressional Clearing House of the Future. That was a caucus that started. I started the uh, North American Society of Corporate Planning in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. So, not marketing. See, this is, who's, okay, what are we going to do in five or ten years? Mm -hmm. Right then, we only had the Futurist Society at that mm -hmm. time. And they were like, wackos. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were really, sci-fi kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, that or? was fringy. You yeah. Know? And it really wasn't at right, all. Right, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But that's what it was. So corporate planning. Mm -hmm. See, that was the, and, and you know who's really big in that? It's because of North American society is, is Canada. Mm. And these people, even in the government, the government was even, mm. I, I mean, they attracted very capable people mm. in the government because it, it's more of a honor, you know, the rich went into it. You know, yeah. it's sort of the British influence. Yeah. Mm. So that's, uh, and then, my clients forced me, the greedy clients, because you know, they want to just build more businesses and hire, and I'd find them government stuff to do that. You know? um, and then I just saw a bigger need and a bigger calling, and God, Washington, this is neat shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then how does the rest of the country know about it? Cool. Yeah. But it was very, you know, highbrow stuff. I really started at mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. but, you know, <laughs> um, so did you have fun um, so what you know the the earlier iteration of your current business was right. finding this type of information for fortune 500 companies yeah. right. um, and I was wondering if you had fun doing that or uh, if that were if the challenge was fun I, I assume oh, absolutely yeah and, and I don't know the non-fun part the fun was building a business and having my first million dollar oh. business kind of mm -hmm. I mean that was that's what oh yeah. that was a dream and to have that the rest of my life was shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that was and that's all I lived for at that time. Um, the clients weren't fun. Some were or whatever. But that was that that was not fun. Not everybody is so um, in larger organizations, everybody's so worried about what their 
neighbors say, mm -hmm. you know, and so they're not allowed to have fun because mm -hmm. it may not be appropriate. Mm -hmm. You know, wherever I go, I want to have fun, you know, and I would go to these big Fortune 500 companies and give talks, and when I give a talk, I mean, I, I you know, you see me talk, I mean, I would like, and they're afraid to laugh. Hmm. They're afraid to enjoy themselves yeah. because they're boss, they're associated right next to them. They're not sure if this is supposed to be true or not. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. yeah. and that hurt me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that, it, that again until I went to Harvard Business School a couple years ago and gave a talk up there. And, I, and these are all students, but I felt the same thing. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in an audience like that, I, I just hurt. I almost could cry for them. I mean, I, hmm. I just feel all that you know, fake stuff they have and not afraid to be themselves or whatever. And it hurts me because it, it, it's almost like a waste of talent, a waste of nature. Mm -hmm. It's like making this plant be purple, you know, <laughs> making it something it's not, mm -hmm. you know, and then it can't grow, it can't do anything. And that same hurt was there. And when I saw the consumer side, I, mean, I could go on TV and be the biggest idiot in the world and have fun and, and also educate yeah. that way. And that's why I say when I when I taught it was that way. Mm -hmm. See, students, you know, I found that when I taught computer science, if I didn't keep them awake, I couldn't teach anything. Mm -hmm. And that's where I saw that. And then mm -hmm. in business, mm -hmm. when I was giving seminars, I said, boy, if I didn't keep them awake. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. I couldn't do it. So what were some of the types of programs you would uh, help these Fortune 500 companies find? Well, it was a lot of, actually, it was mo more information. I mean, like, if they wanted to sell electric blankets in Germany. Well, I'd call the German embassy, and they'd give me some study. Yeah. The German embassy, our embassy in Germany, I talk to someone there, and they go out and give me this study that somebody did for $100,000 and sent it to me for free. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'd sell it to my corporate guy for ten grand or whatever the hell I could get for it. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and show them you know, uh, money programs or whatever it is for them to grow their business. And... Um, and yeah, and then seminars. Then I saw that consulting is, well, I couldn't make a lot of money at consulting because I didn't have a good enough union. Hmm. You know, my theory was that consulting, the bigger you get, uh, there's diseconomies of scales when you're right. selling time. Right. And unless you have a, so you have to become more expensive. Mm -hmm. When I was in my bedroom, I remember, charging $25 an hour, I would make a Money. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then I had an office down K Street. I was charged a hundred bucks an hour, and I wasn't making any money. <laughs> you know, because the overhead yeah. and all, all that yeah. kind of stuff. It's not yeah. scalable. Yeah, it's not scalable. If I could charge three hundred bucks an hour, like the expensive lawyers and consultants do, mm -hmm. I could make money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you couldn't when you don't have a good union. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. So I was not classified. I was like almost like a researcher versus mm -hmm. a consultant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. And, and couldn't charge enough, but. Then I saw if I could get a, a five hundred or a thousand people in a room and charge them five hundred bucks a pop to come and hear me all day, whew, you know, I just do that once, <laughs> or send them a book, mm -hmm. you know, and do a bunch of research, put it in a book, and sell for a hundred bucks a pop yeah. a couple thousand times. Yeah, you know, that was a better business. Yeah, I could do that in my underwear too. <laughs> right. So after, at some point, was there was there a turning moment? Uh, was there any, any um, you know, epiphany or aha moment where, where you decided to switch from consulting Fortune 500s to um, trying to help uh, regular American citizens take advantage of these free government services that they pay for? Uh, no, it always is funny when you say aha moment. I'm reading a lot of books on innovation, and they say how that's a fallacy, uh -huh. aha moments and things like that. It really doesn't. And, and, and they, I don't know if I told you about the uh, Picasso effect. No, remind me. Uh, Picasso, this is apparently a real story, but who knows? Uh, he was at a county fair or something. Somebody comes up to him and wants an autograph. You know, he's an old guy and everything. So he, he, he rips off a bag, you know, part of a bag the guy had, signs his name and does a little doodle and gives back the bag and said, the, the signature and the doodle. So that's $50,000. But it only took you a second. <laughs> No, it took me 60 years. <laughs> and that's why the, the, these aha moments or anything like that, yeah. I mean, they, they, no, it's what happens before that and mm -hmm. after that mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. are really 
you know, I mean, I have so many aha moments that don't work. <laughs> so aha moments that don't really matter. And that's why it, it, it is, I mean, my theory about that is you, you, you can't really think of the best and you take what you think is the best at the time and that leads you to something. So like mm-hmm. when I started the consulting business, after a while I say, you know, oh, it's not money and consulting, it's over here, you know, mm-hmm. like doing the publications, doing the conferences, mm-hmm. that, that that's better for me. Yeah, or that mm-hmm. it's more lucrative and, and more scalable mm-hmm. and things like that. Consumers, I would give speeches at libraries. I might, at times, maybe, maybe not, but I would speak to librarians. I was very good. But then somebody approached me to write a consumer book. Mm-hmm. I, I, would, I would go after publicity and, and mainstream publicity because I had no money to market. And I, mm-hmm. I saw that. Hey, if I could get the Wall Street Journal to write me up, I was putting ads in the Wall Street Journal for a thousand dollars or something like this, you know, and I get nothing. You know, but if, if I came out with a free newsletter on how to get free information, and they wrote me up for free, mm-hmm. and then I got people, yeah, then that's when I said, hey, this is better than yeah. anything else. Cool. So, are there any programs that uh, you're most excited about right now? Um, especially, you know, I guess post-stimulus package stuff. Are, are there any particular programs or sets of programs that, uh, uh, that excite you the most and energize you the most to, to share yeah. with people? Non-money programs. You know, money to me doesn't matter. Maybe <laughs> because I have it or something like that. But, but even when you don't have it, that's not the important thing. I mean, to me, it's the expertise. You know, if you're an inventor, I could show you how to get help to work on your invention for free. You know, when you see the ads for people that will charge it, and you call these invention companies, they're going to get $10,000 from you. And, I, and that's, oh, God, you know, that there's an office over there, there's thousands around the country mm-hmm. that will do that same thing that an invention company does, and they don't have that motive of just getting money out of you, mm-hmm. too. So they have pure motives to help you mm-hmm. than that company, or, or people to help you with debt. I mean, we're in debt up there at Keister, and we still see ads. I'm going to help you with debt, you know. All those things. I mean, oh God, I know that there's thousands of people doing better and free, but you don't know. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody knows. I mean, that's, ooh, it, 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 that's because I know information. I mean, see, uh, God, I mean, they could work with you and, and help you with that debt problem better than if you got a grant for twenty thousand dollars or whatever it is. Yeah, and then plus it's going to take you. Five months to find that place. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so you get the help and structure it, and really to help you. Any problem is solvable if you admit it and understand it. Most of us just feel the water coming through the floor mm-hmm. and don't, you know, hope it doesn't, you know, come <laughs> the rest of the way in and ignore it as long as we can until mm-hmm. it's over our head. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's that. I mean, you've seen us with information from the government about illnesses and mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. Legal information, I mean, just think how you were like, we showed you how to get legal information mm-hmm. to protect yourself. We use these mm-hmm. government regulators that yeah. better than hiring a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Neat. So on the flip side, are there any programs you found um, which you think are no-brainers to, to cut right. off? You know, we were on, you were on Fox News just the other right. week, and they were right. pressuring you yeah, to you know, right. look at the bad side yeah. of things. But I, I was wondering if there were any, any yeah, programs yeah, you yeah. found that you thought were reasonably uh, uh, easy to ditch. Oh, uh, yeah. Probably half the government we could ditch. <laughs> <laughs> my, my one thing right now is I don't understand why, why, why rich people get money. Yeah. Yeah, particularly from programs that are supposed to stop you from being poor. I mean, hmm. certainly, okay, I can understand the logic. If, if you're going to create jobs and you're rich people, and there's incentive to create a certain kind of jobs. But we have have programs like uh, Social Security are there for if you're a senior that you don't be poor. But you know, people making over a hundred thousand dollars get more from that program than people making less than fifteen thousand dollars. Really? Yeah. Now well, that's stupid. Yeah, that's why I started the scholarship. Uh huh. So uh-huh. that that is any program. It would be like, well, everybody lives here. Well, you all deserve food stamps. <laughs> yeah, and, and that, yeah, that just doesn't seem right. I mean, it seems that we have the society. Some some of government should be to help. You know, like your church helps the poor, or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's another way to be more organized. Mm-hmm. I think as a government to help people in need. Uh, so that, mm-hmm. yeah, I think we should. 
probably look at income testing more of these programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or like now here, a job, we have training money. You can get up to $10,000 to train for a new job. Yeah. And you can be a doctor out of work temporarily mm -hmm. and get 10 grand and learn some new procedure. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's for them. You know, mm -hmm. for somebody who doesn't have a degree, really needs a skill or whatever, they're the people we should. Yeah. Do. I don't have to worry about that guy with a PhD yeah. or, or <laughs> well, like you people know, in and out the, of the prison system and yeah, justice yeah, system. These yeah, people criminal need justice that more than, than, than these other people. So I, I think they see that's an income mean, means test. So the doctor's on the work. You see, directly on a income, but you know, he, he's got a condo in Florida worth a quarter million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. Um, and so those kinds of things. I mean, mm. it, 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 and I guess we're trying to be fair or something, or the law is written in a way like right. that. But so there's a lot like that. Uh, and people who get it or like Social Security. I mean, I'm going to. And that's what I saw. I saw now. I'm going to get. I could get 15 grand a year or something like that right now. And so I was like, well, I don't need that. Yeah. Why? But what am I going to do? You know, call the Treasury. No, you could keep it. They do have an office for that. Mm -hmm. You could send it back. People are not going to do that. Mm -hmm. But I see here, I mean, like in the area where we live, you know, lawyers are making a million dollars a year at 65, 70 years old, still working or whatever, and they're getting 15 grand. I mean, that's like three lunches for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's like to me that the uh, um, the community college where you go to college for, for a thousand bucks for a year. Yeah. You know, that's, that's nothing for that's value. Cool. You know, that's great value. All right, a little more fun direction. When did you start wearing the question mark suits and why? Um, always dressed, you know, I was a clothes horse all the time. Very expensive, yeah. You know. mm. um, I mean, you see my early Larry King things or whatever, and fancy ties and pocket pinkies and little short, you know, fancy scarves and you know, uh, suspenders like Larry King. <laughs> and... Uh, Ah, just something in me. I always wanted to get the balls to do it. Younger, I used to have wild suits as a business consultant. I didn't as much. They were just expensive. And, uh, somehow, I always wanted to do it. Uh, the courage. But it was a great talking about an aha moment, a moment that really changes your life. That did. And it was so hard in the beginning. People threw me off of shows and lost a lot of money. I'd, I'd show up in the beginning, because like, I was doing regular talk shows all the time. Oh, you can't wear that on here. You know, I don't just show up and go, no, 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 no. I'd take it off and sit there in my shirt and do the interview. <laughs> Stupid. Yeah. And now it's, hey, yeah, I'm going to have to wear it. So it really, I learned so much from that. And I always thought maybe there'd be another step after that. Hmm. You know, everything I see in life, it, you want to do it, but that's just a step to somewhere mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. I can't find the next one. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, mm. you know, the suit. You know, I don't know what it is. There's nothing. Mm. I don't know. Maybe I have to be. Maybe I'm going to die in these things. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know what mm. the next reiteration is. Yeah. You know, of the suit. How many years has it been? Oh, probably a year. Right here. I mean, I say something like that, but I've been yeah. saying it for eight or nine years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, you were wearing them when I was 90s, in like. Yeah. Yeah, somewhere in the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have it too. I wrote a book, one of the dozens and dozens that never saw Infophobia. Uh -huh. That's when I had the first one made, so I could go look and look at that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I have. So maybe you're right, maybe it's 15. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool. And what's it like walking down the streets of D.C. and elsewhere in the country? Great. <laughs> God, I love it. I, I miss it when I go. People are so nice to me. I mean, really, oh, God, I, mean, I don't know about you, but maybe because you had such adulation when you were young, you know, the president and everything at 10 years old. I, I never had any of that positive feedback. You know? mm -hmm. So, and, and it's a way that, you know, people come up and they tell me how much they like my work or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you've seen it. I try not to, you know, pay attention. I, all I can think of is if I was your age and had this man, I'd be a real asshole. <laughs> you would be able to put up with me. I would just, now I know it doesn't matter and I have more important things to do, but it, it, it's nice. And it, it's warmth. It's the warmth of, I mean, people are great. I always like people. And, and so they're giving you more. It's kind of hungry. 
Mm -hmm. All the time. Mm -hmm. Free hugs. Right. <laughs> That's what that is. Right? Yeah, and I'm always amazed by the... Uh, uh, it's so rare for negative feedback oh, for you. Oh, you know? Me. I'm a guy like you. I mean, I'm this big macho guy who's going to confront everybody. And, you know, I could do with all that kind of shit. Defend my honor. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, I'd rather drive away, you know. Um, and that was my biggest fear, and that's what stopped me. So in my 50s, I was just less involved in that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time you get to the hormone level, mm -hmm. is, is less. And, but that's what kept me from doing it. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, in the 10, 15 years or whatever it is that I've been doing this thing, it's three times that happens. And now you're going to happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You saw that interview with uh, the um, gospel documentary. I mean, these people come on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I could remember like maybe one or two incidents yeah, like exactly. that in all the years of somebody saying something negative about exactly. you know, your face, you know. Right. Most people, you know, it seems like most people who uh, either don't like you or don't get you are just too confused and baffled exactly. and just avoid eye contact and whatnot. Right. But yeah, exactly. very, very little sus substantive. I got a note in an airplane that was wonderful. Uh, toward the end of the airplane, the stewardess gave me. Uh, I saw you walk in this plane, and I thought you were the, you know, it was just the stupidest thing I've ever saw. Yeah, you know, and that you were just, you know, I hated you. And I sat here the whole plane, and I think about it. I really applauded it. Huh. And it, it was just amazing. Huh. And that's another thing, what I see, and I, even wow. in the, uh, here, I almost feel a responsibility to show people they can do what they want to do in life. Like even the neighbor kids is something I always felt a responsibility in mm -hmm. doing that. And that's what it really is. That people, you can go out and do what you want. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's about. <laughs> and that's why I feel an obligation to do it. Yeah. Because to show people, you know, it makes me feel bad or not worse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Pops. You bet. Boy, we're all the two crybabies here. <laughs> 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 I agree.